I've been wanting to mention to you, and one of them is to commend you on the beauty of the church during the Christmas season. Uh, each year, when the Christmas season comes, we decorate the church, and it is always very beautiful, and it seems to become more and more so over time. And I think this past Christmas season, the church was exceptionally beautiful. And I do thank you for the hard work involved, but also the artistry <clears throat> that goes into decorating this church so well. I God bless you for it. And uh, also, I thank you very much for your generosity, not only for myself, but for Father Greenwell and for the other priests as well. May God bless you for that. It is duly noted, believe me, and I remember benefactors at each Mass when I'm here, but also when I'm back at Immaculate Conception or at St. Teresa's. I always keep in mind uh, benefactors, and I'm very grateful to them, that is to you, for your kindness. So may God bless you for it. <clears throat> now please consult your bulletin for the rest of the information today. The epistle for... This Mass of Septuagesima Sunday is taken from the first epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brethren, know you not that they that run in the race all run indeed, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain, and every one that striveth for the mastery refraineth himself from all things, and they indeed that they may receive a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible one. I therefore so run, not as at an uncertainty, I so fight, not as one beating the air, but I chastise my body and bring it into subjection, lest perhaps when I have preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. For I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all in Moses were baptized in the cloud and in the sea, and all drank the same spiritual drink. And they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. But with the most of them, God was not well pleased. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. <clears throat> the Gospel is taken from that according to St. Matthew, chapter 20, verses 1 to 16. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. At that time, Jesus spoke to his disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like to a householder who went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And having agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing in the marketplace idle. And he said to them, Go you also into my vineyard, and I will give you what shall be just. And they went their way. And again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did in like manner. But about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he saith to them, Why stand you here all the day idle? They say to him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith to them, Go you also into my vineyard. And when evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith to his steward, Call the laborers and pay them their hire, beginning from the last even to the first. When therefore they were come that came about the eleventh hour, they received every man a denarius. But when the first also came, they thought that they should receive more. And they also received every man a denarius. And receiving it, they murmured against the master of the house, saying, These last have worked but one hour, and thou hast made them equal to us that have borne the burden of the day and the heats. But he answering said to one of them, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is thine, and go thy way. I will also give to this last, even as to thee. Or is it not lawful for me to do what I will? Is thy eye evil, because I am good? So shall the last be first, and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. Please be seated. <coughs> Go you also into my vineyard. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dear faithful, we now have the violet vestments on the altar and on the priest. And so it shall be, these Sundays, 
through Septuagesima and Sixagesima and Quimpagesima, through Ash Wednesday and the Sundays of Lent. The green vestments have been retired during all of this time and will not reappear for some time now. The word Alleluia has disappeared from our liturgy during this time, except on the feast days celebrated, the feast days of the saints, but from the liturgy of the time, the purple vestments will preclude that that word of praise, because that's what it is. It's, it's a prayer, actually. The word Alleluia is a hymn of, of rejoicing, and that will not appear again in the liturgy of the time, the temporal cycle of the liturgy, until the day before Easter, the Easter Vigil. Now, we see that we have uh, come with our Lord a certain way in his life. We, for the last two months, have, as it were, been honoring our Lord in his Infancy. We've honored his birth, his infancy, and his childhood. We heard the voices of the angels singing glory to God in the highest. In the heavens over Bethlehem. And we followed the shepherds then to the manger, and there we knelt with them in adoration. At the foot of the manger, we recognized we, kneeling, recognized our, our Lord and Savior. We also, as it were, followed the star with the Magi. The shepherds representing the Jews had waited for thousands of years for the promised one to come to them. The Magi were pagans, and the miles that they traveled through the desert were their vigil, that represented kind of an equivalent or a counterpoint to the Jews' thousands of years of waiting, the miles that these Gentiles trod through the desert following the star to the foot of the manger. And there we too met the kings as they bowed and offered their gifts. And we also offered with theirs, ours as well, symbolically, in the manger, on Christmas Day and after that. We then followed our Lord. We followed him to the temple when his mother and foster father took him there to be presented, and as it were ransomed by the two turtle doves, or the sacrifice of the two turtle doves, we heard there the prophecy of Simeon, that a sword would pierce Our Lady's hearts, that the souls of many in Israel would be risen or fall because of this, the Savior who had come, the redemption, and one who would be a light of revelation to the Gentiles. We saw our Lord at the age of 12 remain in the temple as his mother and foster father made their way northward back to Nazareth, only to find that he was not with them and returned to, Nazareth, to Jerusalem, very anxious for his welfare. We saw these things happen. We accompanied our Lord during these times. We even went so far as our Lord's adulthood when he went to the feast of Cana and at the wedding feast, worked his first public miracle and took that first great, great step toward Calvary. And now, now we join our Lord at a different moment in his life. We have just seen him <clears throat> proclaimed by John the Baptist as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The very words we use when we turn at the altar with the host and say, Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. And so it is those very words we, we say from the altar holding the host before us at Mass. But now we see that our Lord has come for a very, very important reason. Actually, two very important reasons. We see that our Lord himself has come to us, as he himself has said, to accomplish two things. 
this is something that's important for every one of us to remember, <clears throat> because no matter what others may say about the Gospels and what our Lord tells us in the Gospels, it is very clear that our Lord himself speaks of two things that he has come to do. Over and over again, he reminds us of these things. He tells us that he's come to give his life on the cross as a sacrifice, the sacrifice, the sacrifice to the Father for the redemption of mankind from their sins. This is his first great work that he's come to accomplish. This is the reason for all the rest. This is why he became incarnate in the first place, precisely to accomplish this purpose of offering this great sacrifice in obedience, out of love for the Father on the cross for us, that he may justify us for our sins and sanctify us by grace to raise us to a supernatural life which will actually enable us, take us to him and take us to him in heaven. This is the first great mission of our Lord. And with Septuagesima Sunday, we see our Lord turn his face toward this great mission in great earnestness. And as we have followed him, and as he's invited us to follow him, through the days of his birth and his infancy and his childhood and his first great miracle of Cana, so he invites us now to follow him still and to take those steps forward with him as he sets his face now to the Father's will on Calvary. And we also see our Lord telling us in the Gospel that he has come to establish his church. This is the second great purpose of our Lord in coming, to establish his church. <clears throat> And he, in doing this, establishing the church, he conferred upon his church the powers of justifying and sanctifying souls with the justification and the sanctification that he obtained for us through the sacrifice in Calvary. He entrusted that to his church. And this power of the priesthood remains here in the world today. It is certainly under attack, certainly under attack, of all places, from Rome itself, from the Vatican itself, as the modernists have set their sights on destroying this great mission. They see our Lord coming to establish his church and to confer upon it the powers of his redemption. And they have sought the power over the church to frustrate the church and actually to then crush in the church those powers that Christ gave to it. <clears throat> but our Lord so constituted his church that even when wicked men are in power, they cannot crush the power of the priesthood of holy orders. Even the power of magisterium, the power of dictating, as it were, a false religion in modernism, which is no real power from Christ at all, or they have the raw power to, they say, change the moral law of God, they cannot impugn the power of the priesthood, which our Lord gave and enables us to, to exercise, as it were, in these days, even independently. And our Lord has set it up that way very, very wisely, as you can see. So that the power of the church to, sanct to justify souls and sanctify them can never be thwarted by the powers of hell. That power can continue and does continue even today. <clears throat> now, when we look at this uh, feast of this, this Sunday of Septuagesima, we see here the epistle and the gospel. And in the epistle, we see St. Paul talking about running the race, fighting the fight. He says he's not fighting the air as though he's shadow boxing. He tells us he's actually fighting himself. He's actually in, as it were, a battle of life and death battle with himself. He talks about in one place the old man of sin and the new man who is born of grace in him. And he says there must be this battle and one must win. He says that he actually could preach to others 
the faith and yet become a cast off himself, a castaway. In other words, he's not saved by faith alone, but he has to be faithful to God in the way he lives. And this is, of course, the teaching of the Catholic Church, which was denied by Luther and those who follow him. And so he makes it a very, very important point that it's not simply because we call ourselves Catholics or because we believe what's in the catechism that we are saved. It is actually living our lives according to that belief. So as not to be hypocrites. You know, our Lord was continually talking about that the Pharisees were hypocrites because they professed one thing and they themselves did the opposite. And uh, we could be in danger of the same thing, as St. Paul said that he himself was in danger of the same hypocrisy. If having preached to others, he failed to live the faith and he would become a castaway. St. Paul even talks about his own Hebrew people in the desert who were re- drinking of the water that was given to them to drink in the desert from the rock, as you read in the book of Exodus and what came after. You read about these miraculous events that saved the Jews in the desert as they had left Egypt and were trying to gain the promised land. And yet St. Paul says, even though they were all fed with the manna and they all drank of the, of the rock, Our Lord was not pleased. God was not pleased with most of them. And so he warns that, again, it's not just a matter of uh, partaking of the faith. It's a matter of practicing and living the faith. It makes a difference. It's just a matter of, in other words, believing the faith. It's a matter of living the faith. And in the gospel today, we see what seems at first to offend our sense of justice There are those who worked long and hard throughout the day, and in the end, they were given one day's wage, and those who worked far less were given much more. Now, the fathers of the church are telling us that these words were actually addressed to the Jews, and that the fathers of the church and even the apostles understood our Lord's words to speak of the Gentiles who were called later. You and I actually fit into that category. You know, we, we look back now and we see others who have labored so hard, the apostles themselves, St. Paul personally, labored so hard for the faith that we have now. We see the sacrifices that so many others have made over so many centuries that we have the faith right now And we realize that we ourselves have had to endure very little. In fact, we can't even call what we've endured hardship, suffering, persecution. Basically, whatever we've endured can amount to a little more than inconvenience and uh, maybe a little uh, extra work, a little extra effort. But nonetheless, to suffer persecution as they did, um, that we haven't that we haven't experienced yet, really. But there are many in the world who do today experience that hardship, and so we are like the eleventh hour workers here, and so we have reason to be very grateful. We have reason to be very grateful when when our Lord left the apostles to spread the faith throughout the lands of the pagans. The Jews in Jerusalem did not exactly resent it, but they they didn't feel as though it was somehow cheating them of their birthright. Because the Jews who had accepted the belief in the Savior believed that he really belonged to them. And so they didn't want the Gentiles, uh, as it were, entering into the church forthwith and as though they simply all, all along had a right to be there. Many of them, perhaps most of them, were insisting that these Gentiles had to become Jewish, had to follow the law of Moses before they were allowed to follow Christ. And so the fathers saw in this gospel today a reference to that idea, 
of those who grumbled and said, this is ours, this belongs to us, this is what we agreed on, this is what is due to us, how can you then give it away to others who are just newcomers, they're latecomers, what right do they have to this? Let them come to us first, and only through us then can they come to you, O oh God. And so uh, if this parable was given by our Lord, as it certainly was, and understood by the early church to refer to the Gentiles being called to the church without having gone through the history of the offspring of Abraham, the chosen people, then you and I should take that to heart and realize we have an enormous amount of gratitude to give. We have an enormous debt of gratitude to give to God that he's called us, as it were, the 11th hour workers here today to have the benefit of the faith, even here in this world now, even under these circumstances. And we should be extremely grateful to our Lord for this. The emphasis here, therefore, should not be really on the indignation of those who were uh, offended because they were given the denarius. In this case, the denarius represents us the reward of, of justification, sanctification, everlasting life. But actually, the reward also is given to others who uh, have uh, so far offered so less, given so less, sacrificed so, so much less than others. So this is a call to us to appreciate the benefit of the cross that has come to us, the justification of our sins and the sanctification of our souls by grace. Thank God for that. As our Lord goes forward, in the seven weeks ahead, we, are, we will follow him there too. We will follow him to the accomplishment of his great purposes so that we can be part of those great purposes. Now, after Mass today, I will be enrolling at least one dear soul in the fivefold scapular and then have a confession. I'll return to the confessional and then have a couple of appointments to, to make. But uh, as many as you can, I, I look to see you at Mass tomorrow, if at all possible. And uh, God bless you. Please keep in your prayers one little newborn child, a little baby named Cash Herman. He is ill. The doctors do not yet know what the disease is, what the malady is, but they are trying to diagnose this. But I ask you to please keep him and his family in your prayers. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.